Milking by Michael Sisko. Every morning, Lucas came downstairs, passed through the parlor and the kitchen, and entered the small room at the back of the house to find his glass of milk waiting for him in a saucer on the table, a gleaming white tube in the gloom back there, the sides of the glass peppered with droplets of gem-like condensation. The noise of the surf came in through the thin window panes, and, as Lucas took the cool glass in both hands and raised it carefully to his mouth, his father would come in behind him to watch him drink it, perhaps to make certain that he drank all of it. The chill bulk of the milk would shift swallow by swallow from the glass to his belly, vanish into him in a few moments, and he would return the glass, containing nothing now but a settling white film, solemnly to its saucer. Turning around, he would fully enter the benevolent presence of his father, who would settle his blessing hand carefully on the head of his son and smile, his brow contracted. Then mother would join them, taking away the glass and saucer, while father set breakfast on the table for them all. This small room in the back of the house was square, protruding from the rear of the building like a snub nose with windows that overlooked the shore. This table stood on one leg, and the chairs surrounding it were all different. Lucas had a fine velvet seat with little pads riveted along the curved back. His father sat on a stool, and his mother had a narrow, high-backed chair with a shallow seat. Taciturn, soft-spoken, gentle, they murmured to each other and to him in voices that were barely audible over the rush of the waves. They ate all their meals in the cramped back room of the house to spare the pristine dining room, which, as far as Lucas could remember, had been exclusively reserved for the purpose of celebrating his birthday. For the remainder of the year, the dining room was merely another room his parents had to keep clean and in good order, almost as if it were possible he might surprise them by having a birthday at any time. Occasionally, he would look in at the door of the dining room to see the pale reflection of the dim light of day glistening against the stacked edges of the plates in the porcelain cabinet and warming the polished wood of the long tabletop. After breakfast, Lucas usually would sit for a little while in the parlor, perhaps still gazing at the empty space where the patio used where the piano used to be, wondering what had been wrong with it, waiting for his mother's sister, Aunt Inger, to come by with her own children and see him safely to school. However, it was the winter holiday now, and so Lucas was at liberty to do whatever he liked, provided he didn't leave the radius of his parents' supervision. I'm taking Smokey down to the beach, he told his mother. She turned her thin face to him, smiling, her red-rimmed eyes full of love. Stay within sight of the house, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I will, I said. When he entered the kitchen, Smokey was lying in his usual spot, not far from the stove. He was what father called a good-sized dog, but lean, who rose with a little difficulty when Lucas called to him. They left the house, the yard, and walked down to the, sl to the shore. The day was misty, but not too cold. Looking back, Lucas could see his mother's figure in the window of her bedroom upstairs. Down below, his father stood watching from the kitchen window. The beach was nearly empty, and there was no one nearby. Lucas spent the morning tossing stones and sticks that Smokey would eventually retrieve, dropping them at his feet, then looking around a moment before raising his head, searching blearily until he found the boy's eyes, then lowering his head again. Standing on the beach, Lucas saw a vacant, endless world stretched out on every side. Even the enormous ocean was engulfed in a haze of mist and spray that collected the particles of his vision only to disperse them into a glowing white cloud of the vault of nature that dwarfed the straggling line of houses along the coast, and the little town tucked into a notch in the coastline, a narrow harbor there, where the mountains veered closer to the water and raised the surrounding land. There again were his parents, tiny figures moving about a doll's house, bleached and peeling, left out in the sun and rain. Lucas waited to see if any of his friends, 
The children who lived in the neighboring houses would turn up, but none of them did. This happened sometimes. Lucas didn't mind being alone with Smokey. He could always sneak away, go exploring up toward the ruins of the old pier. But the last time he went out of Citadel the house, his parents had become both so distraught that their behavior alarmed him, and their, refu their relief at seeing him again, their sadness too, buffeted him with quiet words and cautious gestures, leaving him with an uneasy feeling that didn't go away for a long time. There was something about their quiet fussing, their distress, that made him feel as though he'd inflicted a more lasting kind of harm to them in some way. After school, one or another of his teenage cousins would take care of him while his father was away and his mother was resting, but now his cousins weren't available, it seemed. Aunt Inger was busy, too, with holiday things he only vaguely understood, but when he came in again, slightly dazed from a glut of space and sea air, she was there, sitting in the parlor, talking with his mother. "'We'll start soon,' she told Aunt Inger as he came into the house. She greeted him warmly, as always, and his mother smiled her close-slipped smile at him. "'Did you have a nice walk?' she asked. "'It's so misty,' he said. "'It is,' Aunt Inger said. "'You're right.' Lucas felt encouraged by this and began speaking. Aunt Inger and his mother listened to a recitation of his observations that day with little cooings of appreciation. When he finished, Aunt Inger said, He has the eye of an artist. We should get him a painting set. Mother gave her a particular look then, and Aunt Inger added immediately, When the time is right. Lucas knew that his parents did not want to spoil him, that this was the meaning of that look, and since the prospect of receiving a painting set didn't stir him in any way, he didn't wonder about the time. There was, though, an idea to, albeit an inchoate, elusive one, more like an impression, that the concern of his parents mysteriously combined their reluctance to spoil him with the disappearance, one by one, of various things belonging to the family. The piano, the old gilt mirror that used to hang over the mantelpiece, and the porcelain figurines that had been kept with great care on a shelf high on the wall. He had started to believe that, as children grow, their houses became more empty. Growing was an invisible process that converted time into accumulated physical size. There was something plausible, or at least symmetrical, about the idea that there was a balance involved, that nothing came from nothing, and something like the piano or the mirror had to be lost in order for him to grow. Everyone, his parents, his teachers, his many relatives, all referred often to his promising future. From time to time he thought about it, but he really couldn't imagine it. The future for him could never be anything but scenes from a storybook, rewritten with himself at the center. Lucas was happy as he was. He had no strong desire to change, and very little curiosity about himself. For him, growing was something that was happening to him, not something he was doing. It would happen in any case. Nothing would stop it. There was nothing he could do about it, and no reason to care about it. As he outgrew his clothes, they would be replaced with similar, larger versions. Smokey was old. He would die some day, but there would be another dog then, of the same size, who would fill his place in the household. Maybe they would bury him on the beach, under the sand. Lucas padded up the thickly carpeted stairs to his room after a few more words with his aunt, who told him that his cousins would be coming by later for dinner. He received this news ambivalently. What he really wanted to do was play with imaginary friends, children who weren't there, so that he could enjoy himself without having to be seen or to respond. His mother and his aunt began whispering together as he went upstairs, which was not strange, and his mind was crossed by the pleasant suspicion that they might be planning some kind of surprise for him. The enemy emerged from beneath his bed in sinister, deviously moving ranks, but the vigilant defenders did not fail to notice and repel them. As he played, he heard from time to time the faint tinkling of the door chime, followed by muted greetings, sung high or rumbled low. These were his cousins, his uncle, Aunt Inger's friend Lily. As the gloom of the day began to deepen in the late afternoon, he looked up to see his mother gazing fondly at him from the threshold of his bedroom, obscured by the shadow of the open door. "'Come down and say hello to everyone,' she said. They were at the top of the stairs. 
Lucas could hear the family voice meshed in a subdued music below. He was struck by the almost furtive way everyone spoke again and again. Every, everyone spoke and again thought of some nice surprise that might be waiting for him. His mother then turned to face him when she was a few steps down, the better to fix his eyes with her own. Just remember to keep away from the kitchen until we're done in there, she said. This was a command he was always given on these occasions, and it had a special status. He knew his parents doted on him and were forgiving to a fault, but this was one of the few iron rules they'd established. Once, when the distinctive creak of the kitchen door caught his attention and he'd gone without thinking to peek inside, his father had stepped in front of him, springing up like a mythological soldier to bar his way. Go read with your Auntie Inger, he'd said. He spoke in the even tone that he always used, but there was a startled look in his eye that Lucas did not fail to notice, although he didn't comprehend it. His friends, however, had all told him about inexplicably firm rules in their families, and even arbitrary commands, so he assumed this was one of those adult secrets that he would come to understand in time. I, I will, he told his father. They welcomed him on sight in their mild way. Seeing them now in the light of the lamps, which had already been lit, both his parents looked nervous, bright-eyed, flushed pink, self-conscious. Aunt Inger looked like that, too. So did his cousins. It was something that would have been easier to miss if they weren't all together in one place. Lucas wondered about their strange, lingering sadness. But it couldn't be real sadness, even if they kept their voices down like people who didn't want to wake a sleeping baby in the next room. Their manner reminded him, come to think of it, of people with newborn babies in the house. They had that same odd combination of fatigue and alertness. What was it? They were all overwhelmed with adult business. That's the way it is. He felt more grown up for thinking about it, that way closer to his parents and relatives, and a mimicry of resignation passed over him as a novel and interesting experience. Lucas greeted everyone, and then Aunt Inger led him across the hall to the sewing room. The light was better there. Together they sat on the stiff horsehair sofa, she reading to him and he looking at the illustrations and following the tip of her tapering finger as it scanned the lines of text. This was one of his favorite books. He knew the story by heart, and took satisfaction in the way the events slotted reliably into place, one after another. As she read, he could hear the bustle of preparations going on in the house, the regular squeak of the kitchen door, the tramp of feet, the incessant murmur. After a while, his father appeared in the door, summoning Aunt Inger to assist his mother with the last preparations. He looked haggard, but then helping to make family dinner always seemed to tax him, and he didn't fail to give his son an encouraging smile. Are you hungry? he asked. Oh, yes, Lucas, Lucas said. His father laughed inaudibly. We'll begin in a minute, he said, going away with Aunt Inger. Lucas went to the bathroom in the meantime, then made his way through the back of the house toward the parlor, where he could hear the clank of plates and plink of steel forks and spoons. They didn't use the silver anymore. The door was open. The kitchen was in its usual order, redolent now of onions and chicken, and there was another unfamiliar smell, too. There was something unusual about the kitchen, he realized. The door in the corner, what they called the closet door, and which was supposed to be impossible to open for some reason, was ajar. He'd never seen inside, and his parents had told him clearly that the door was useless. Had they been hiding something from him, or had they only just managed to get it open? He slipped across the kitchen, and, making sure no one was coming, peeked in. The next moment he heard the tread of what was almost certainly his mother coming up behind him, and he impulsively slipped into the closet, pulling the door back to where it was. I'll just get the bowls, his mother was saying. The bowls were kept in cupboards on the far side of the kitchen. If she were only retrieving them and bringing them out to the table in the parlor, not the dining room, then he could duck out of the closet unnoticed when she left again in a few moments. He couldn't be sure he was doing anything his parents wouldn't permit him to do. The odd smell was much stronger in the closet, which was, he now saw, actually a small room, completely bare except for a plain wooden table situated directly beneath the skylight. And the room smelt. He never smelled anything like it. It was a gamey smell, not meat, not like a butcher's shop, not quite, 
but a little like that, and maybe just a little like the smell of sweet of of sweat, freshly sweated. There was a trace of pungency too, like a a little like stagnant seawater. He couldn't connect this disgusting smell with anything he'd ever encountered before in the house, but at the same time, it wasn't really unfamiliar, was it? Where did it come from? It was everywhere in the room, equally strong. It was just the smell of the room itself. He heard the clatter of bowls as his mother gathered them. Moving quietly, he went over to the table. There were no drawers, nothing. Did they reserve this room only to store this one table? He looked beneath the table and found nothing there except what might have been some scuff marks in the thin dust on the floor. As he looked, he kept his balance by pressing his hand and forearm against the top of the table, and noticed then that the wood was warm. He drew his palm over the top and found it was nearly all uniformly warm, as if a big basin of hot water had been left there for a while. Near the far corner to him, he spotted a splash of milk. Was this where they kept the milk they gave him each morning? Were they all out? Was that why there was nothing in this room but this table? Did they pour out a bowl of warm milk in here? Was it milk he was smelling? Maybe, he thought with a little rush of pleasure at figuring out a possible explanation for this enigma. They were making cheese in here and he would find it waiting for him on the table. His mother was hurrying back to the parlor, most likely with an armful of bowls, and so he slipped out of the closet or little room, carefully replacing the door as it was, and then started out, darted out into the hall so that he could enter the parlor through the door closer to the sewing room and fool everyone into thinking he'd come from there. When he entered, the same faint cheer that had rose to meet him earlier was repeated, and he took his place, suppressing a thrill at the thought that his ruse had worked, that his trespass would not be noticed. Then came a flash of alarm at the thought of the dusty floor, the possibility that he'd left tracks in it. But no, he would have seen their tracks too, wouldn't he? It was clear they were using the room, that they had been misleading him about it. Hadn't the door swung on its hinges easily? Wouldn't they be fused, that's it, rusted shut if the door hadn't been used in such a long time? Maybe they put Smokey in there sometimes? Was it Smokey he'd been smelling? Was there something wrong with him that they were keeping from him that they had to treat in secret? Smokey was old, but he seemed well enough. He never smelled like that, even when he doused himself in the ocean. That wasn't the answer. Sitting on all manner of chairs filling their plates with the food on the coffee table and then perching them on the crowded little side tables they all ate together talking merrily in their hushed way his cousins were giddy like people who were so tired they were starting to find it funny and aunt inger knocked over a wine glass with a clumsiness that wasn't like her at all they were all drinking very freely and even his parents while they were more restrained than the others still tossed back glass after glass Smokey munched food from his bowl by the fireplace. Lucas looked surreptitiously for a cheese dish. The smell of the little room was here in the parlor too now, but so faint he wondered if it weren't clinging to his own clothes. There was no clear source for it. The smell was simply there, like the watery twilight filtering through the faded dimity curtains and mingled with the vinous smell of drinking, the savory onion smell of their dinner. Everyone was kind to Lucas and made a point of saying something to him. When the meal was over, the adults rearranged the parlor for coffee, and the younger cousins took charge of Lucas and played a board game with him in the sewing room. When everyone had departed for the night, his parents cleared up, sighing and agitated with nervous fatigue that made them a little curt with each other. Lucas found himself in the kitchen with his mother, but he simply gave him a feeble smile and continued cleaning up. His father entered the mo a moment later, greeted Lucas in passing, and helped his mother. The door to the little room was closed. Did you enjoy dinner? His father asked him. Lucas nodded. He wondered if he could ask them about the little room without giving them any reason to think he'd looked inside, and perhaps to impose on them the idea that he had not done what he had done. 
why would he ask if he had already seen? So the question would be kind of a lie. But then, hadn't they lied to him about that door being stuck? Lucas didn't find himself asking them anything, and went up to bed when his father told him to, as usual. Everything had been as usual, with the one exception of his discovery of that room whose emptiness would not leave him alone. Lying in bed that night, he imagined the table standing downstairs, confined to that room like an animal in a cage. Now the table was beginning to walk on its stiff wooden legs. He could hear the wooden feet rap against the ground like tiny hooves. It strained upward toward the dim glow of the clouded skylight and began to call out in a high, rasping voice the noise that a table makes when it is dragged across bare floorboards. Left alone at night, it was calling, its voice ringing in the confines of the small room, panting and bumping against the door. Sometimes it was as if he were in the room too, and other times he saw himself, the bed, and down there, and down through the transparent house, to the darkened room, the table shining in its outlines but eclipsed by the darkness, moving unnaturally. There was a squeal of wood downstairs. This persistent but irregular noise drew him back into shallower sleep until he finally came fully awake. L Lucas listened in the dark. He could hear the waves rushing on the beach, and something outside rattling in the wind, and, then, the kitchen door. If I hear it again, then I'm not imagining it, he told himself. He was nearly asleep again when the noise was repeated. I did hear it. I think I did hear it. So if I hear it again, then something's happening. When he heard the squeal again, he felt a flash of irritation. It's night time, he thought, meaning that it didn't seem fair to him that he should have had that he should have to go to bed and be quiet if other people were not required to do the same. Or were his parents making something for him in the kitchen? A nice surprise. That surprise he'd expected during the day, and that hadn't happened. Was it about to happen soon? He probed the soft nullity around him with his hearing, and Without discovering anything definite, he did become aware of action in the night, in the house, down there, like a low rumble, more felt than heard. Lucas wanted to know what was going on, if only so that he could stop thinking about it and get back to sleep. Smokey lay in his nest at the foot of the bed, asleep, very still. The noise didn't faze him, or even awake him. As the top of the stairs came into view, he saw a faint illumination sifting up from below, throwing the railing into dim relief against the darkness. Padding down the steps, he saw that the glow shone from the small gap beneath the kitchen door, making it a livid stripe with a powdery halo. A hushed voice sounded briefly on the other side. If he crept through the dining room, he could come around and see into the kitchen without having to open the door he would be able to see the surprise without being seen, without their knowing he was there. It was only just a moment before he turned the corner that the odor struck him again, sharp, rancid, and bitter, like stale seawater. It wasn't a composite smell. That was what bothered him about it, not just that it was bad, but that it was the smell of some special bad thing, not a chance mixing of smells. They were all there, as if they hadn't left at all, but had only concealed themselves in the house until he'd gone to sleep. They stood in the light of a lantern that blazed with the transparent glare of a very pure and dazzling light that burned a blue-black flaw into his vision, forcing him to blink and look down. In the glare of that pale light, he had seen them all congregated around the wide-open door to the little room. Someone he couldn't make out for the brilliancy of the lamp was directing its beams over the threshold, and everyone was waiting, leaning, looking in. He was reminded of pictures he'd seen of surgical operations in books. There was a long inhalation inside the little room. Someone in there was breathing in and in and in, quietly, but so that the room hummed like a wooden lung. Everyone in the room shifted in reaction to what they were seeing, and Lucas heard a voice from the table inside that could have belonged to either his father or his mother give a long, shuddering groan 
the prayer of a suffering animal, and there was lapping and motion, a releasing of bated breath, and a pressing toward the door, and from hand to hand he saw a tall, clean, empty glass was being passed forward. When the groan came again, louder, barely stifled and more insistent, Lucas staggered, ran, threw himself out the back door and into the wind and spray of the beach at night, losing himself at once in the gusts of icy mist. Lucas ran until the boiling black and white line of the waves compelled him to, causing him to turn and struggle through the sand along the shore. When he stopped and turned, the blank contour of the house was not that far behind him, as inscrutable as any. It was constantly at risk in his vision of sliding into the shapeless mass of the other houses. Lucas's knees buckled. He collapsed on the sand, and the cold made the tears on his face burn like slashes. His head drooped and swam, his face bunched and hot, his nose running, and he knew he didn't have the strength to throw himself into the black and white ocean, which would snatch up, toss, and smash him against the beach. Tomorrow morning exploded with terror. He would stand as ever in front of a tall, gemmed glass of white milk, with the eyes of his father and the weight of everything in life thundering down on top of him without a sound. His hands spread out and traveled over the sand, picking at stones, bits of seaweed, cigarette butts, until he found a pebble that looked right, lifted it, and his eyes caught the gleam of a fragment of broken glass that he picked up instead. Lucas bared his left arm and held the glass edge over its clean skin, shaking with terror in the icy mist. It took him a long time. After a moment, he watched a thin ribbon of amazing red fall across his arm and drift into the sand, forming a little dark patch that grew bit by bit and then stopped. Lucas dropped the glass and studied his arm, examining his red wound, the first of many. <laughs>